Hello and welcome from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, where we've just discovered who's been awarded the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics. Joining me to discuss this year's prize is Professor Josef Nordgren, Chairman of the Nobel Committee in Physics. Professor Nordgren, thank you very much for joining us so soon after the announcement's been made. Could we begin by you telling us who has been awarded the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics? Yeah, the prize is uh, divided in two parts. And one is, uh, goes to Charles Cow uh, for his uh, major contributions to the development of the optical fiber for telecommunication. And the other half is shared by two, uh, Willard Boyle and George Smith. And they have invented the CCD sensor. And that is, in this case, a sheer invention. And as was said in the announcement, these are two uh, achievements that have, affect our everyday lives. They affect the way that we communicate every day. And in fact, the reason why we can broadcast this announcement live around the world is down to these achievements. Could you say a bit more about the, the, the practical achievements that, that, that we're discussing towards this, this year prize? Well, the, the practical achievements are enormous. I mean, if you start with the with optical fiber for telecommunication, uh, there was an awareness of the uh, potential of optical communication um, in more than 50 years ago, but it was not possible because uh, the fibers that were available didn't uh, work. I mean, after 20 meters, uh, most of the light was, was gone. And to solve these problems, that was the key work of Cow that made all these things happen. He was able to identify what the problem was, really, and devise a pathway to, to successful fabrication of the fibers that eventually led to what we have today. And now I think it's uh, more than a billion kilometers of fibers around the world that connects us all almost instantly. And this is due to the work of, of, of uh, Cow, the work that inspired and started the, the uh, evolution of uh, optical communication that we have today. The other, yeah, the other part, uh, to record images directly, electronically. Uh, I mean, we had, of course, TV cameras, the Vidicon type of camera, uh, when, when uh, uh, Boyle and Smith did their work. And actually, they were not primarily after a sensor to record images. They were inspired or, uh, or uh, pushed almost by competing activities in the lab because at Bell Labs, uh, the bubble memory, the magnetic bubble memory was something that people worked on and it would be very important. And uh, somehow I think uh, Boyle and Smith felt a little bit uh, uh, pressed to come up with something that could compete, that could, could uh, uh, offer something in, with respect of memories, so they were actually trying to invent a new type of memory. But in doing that, they soon realized that they had an image sensor that worked perfectly well. And this is the form of uh, image technology that we see in everyday digital cameras? Uh, well, not in everyday digital cameras, because in, 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 uh, in telephones, for instance, those cameras uh, are typically another t technique, but in really high-end cameras, where resolution and sensitivity are really uh, very high, uh, then you find the C CCD technique. So the prize is, is, a, is rewarding the, the use of uh, fiber optics to communicate information throughout the world, one form of which is images which was an invention created by Boyle and uh, Smith. Yes, it's, uh, uh, in, in, in this case it is really an invention and the idea, they come up with the idea and sketched it and come to a, a more or less final solution in a fairly short time. Uh, Cow, he worked for, uh, for several years uh, very methodically to try to find out what were the critical materials, questions, what were the typical or, or the critical uh, uh, light propagation uh, properties and he came up with conclusions that uh, set off quite some activity uh, in order to try to realize and fabricate these fibers. So if we focus on that half of the prize first, you said that the fiber optics were already in use but they, they weren't great at transmitting light through, through the, the optic cable themselves. Cal spent a while trying to work out what was, what was missing, what was wrong with these fibers, spent a, spent a few years working on this and came up with a, with a paper in 1966 to propose what he thought was 
was, was wrong with these optic fibers and how to improve their quality. Could you discuss a little bit about what findings he came up with and how they were actually realized? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the main thing was that he realized that uh, there were impurities. Even though they thought they had very clean glass, it was impurities that uh, impeded the, the, uh, the transmission. And to get rid of, because he could, he, he made uh, theoretical calculations and studies, and he came to the conclusion that it should be much better than it was uh, experimentally. Uh, and uh, also he studied what would be the, the uh, showstoppers or the limiting factors. The real showstopper was impurities, but also the other limiting factors, uh, the scattering and, and uh, uh, excitation in the fiber of, of uh, uh, atomic motion and, and so on, they are the things that set the limit eventually. But uh, to, to get ultra pure fibers, and that was also quite some undertaking to do that. I mean, that were others like Corning Glass that uh, uh, were able after four years to fabricate uh, such fibers and they were very advanced chemical methods that they had to uh, develop and employ in order to, to, to do that. So that was also um, substantial and, and important work that was done by, by, the, by these glass companies. So improving the quality of the glass that sort of encases these fiber optics allowed better performance, allowed less light to be lost as you transmit the signal through them. What was then possible once the, these new, new sort of generation of fiber optics being created? Well, uh, uh, Cow had set up um, uh, a target and, uh, that he thought uh, would be um, enough to make communication feasible. But the companies, they, after four years, were able to, to, to beat that target and even go much further. Uh, but today, of course, uh, when the fibers themselves have something like 95% uh, of the light is still there after one kilometer, but of course if you want to communicate uh, between continents, uh, uh, you still lose quite a lot. So in today's network, fiber network, there's also integrated lasers. You can make a laser in a fiber. So part of the fiber is a laser that amplifies. So you have a number of those amplification stages also that are used in today's fiber networks. And so what is it possible to achieve now with, with fiber optic technology? Well, you, you, you can communicate in the terabit per second uh, range and you can have <coughs> uh, tens of thousands and thousands of, of, of telephone calls in the same fiber and, and so the, the, the capacity of transferring information is enormous and, uh, and uh, uh, it, it's, still, it's still expanding. And, and so uh, the, you decided to give half the prize to George, George Cow for his achievements. Now there have been major achievements before in fiber optic te technology and major achievements afterwards. By awarding one half the prize to, to his landmark paper in 1966, uh, is, the, is the Academy saying that this was the key moment, this was the eureka moment that allowed fiber optics to, 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 to leap a generation to get to the stage where we are now? Yes, and th these are very good cases because the Nobel Prize is, is not really given to lifetime achievements and somehow common knowledge uh, uh, um, suggests that uh, why didn't he or she get the prize, did so much uh, in her life and his life. But the Nobel Prize, we want to award that to singular, uh, really uh, decisive uh, uh, papers or work. And in this case, the invention, I mean, that's clear. They made the invention and it was there. And also Cow's work, he worked for a number of years and then he published this paper. And, and you can really see when things, and then you can see afterwards the impact, what happened when once this was done, it set off such an enormous development. So that's the first half of the prize. If we go, go to the second half of the prize, where we, we said before that through fiber optics we can communicate text and images and videos throughout the world in the blink of an eye. And the second half of the prize is rewarding the, the, uh, the technology that was created to allow us to create digital images and transmit them through fiber optic technology. Um, could you talk us through the achievements that Willard Boyce and George Smith created in allowing us to create and send digital images? Well, <clears throat> first, uh, the CCD cameras, they were used scientifically, and uh, there it made very, very big di difference in, in uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, um, uh, instruments, but in astronomy. I mean, in order to uh, photograph uh, stellar objects, uh, the universe, uh, which we can do, of course, when we can uh, launch satellites, 
uh, but we need to send it back. It would be really awkward if we would have photographic film and, and somehow send that back to Earth for development or, or, or as, as uh, paper printouts. So in order to be able to record images with really high resolution and high sensitivity uh, electronically and just send it by radio down is of course a, a fantastic achievement and, and much of what we have learned over the many decades, several decades at least, uh, uh, from, from uh, space missions and investigations. The Hubble telescope is, of course, a, a brilliant example. The, the pictures we see from the Hubble telescope is uh, made of a <coughs> giant CCD detector with, with, uh, with really very high quality. And, and we are all amazed about those pictures that we can see from the universe. And this, for something that's so familiar in, in, in everyday use, uh, it's quite surprising to find out that this was, in, this was um, developed from a, a brainstorming meeting between the two scientists who awarded the prize. Could you say something about that, please? Uh, isn't, it, isn't it amazing? That, that's, uh, and that's it's so uh, inspiring and fascinating that, that something like that can happen. I mean, they had a, a somewhat different focus what they wanted to, uh, to uh, accomplish, and then they soon realized it could be used also for this other application. But um, we heard uh, in the interview here with Dr. Boyle, he said that at Bell Labs at that time, they had a lot of resources. They had an environment which was very productive and creative, and they can sort of do what they wanted. And there's so much that came out of this lab and other labs who had that kind of possibilities. Unfortunately, I would say, uh, into the 80s uh, or so, Several of those labs, these American labs from, that the big companies had like Bell and Exxon and, and IBM and others, they abandoned some of these, uh, uh, I, I, these ideas to, to have a fairly free uh, possibility for scientists to work on their problems and uh, that's a pity I think. And of course, Bell Labs is no longer with us. No. But um, is, is, is the idea, is the concept of the way that these ideas come about something that the academy um, really wants to promote in, in terms of its overall message? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it is uh, the scientific environment where students, researchers work is is almost everything. I mean, of course, it has to be based on good education and good basic training, but the environment where you work is more than, than, than uh, uh, more important than most other things. And we may not always be so good at creating the cr really creative and free scientific em environment. Uh, so I think uh, the message from Dr. Boyle here in the interview is something we, we should uh, really listen to and, and think about uh, also when it comes to how we plan uh, our scientific endeavors at universities and institutes and how we distribute money, what, what, uh, 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 what we re require from the researchers uh, in order to try to, to help building better and more productive or creative, I would say, more creative scientific environments. It's a great message to tell. Um, if we look at the prizes that are being rewarded today, the, the, the achievements were done in the mid to late 60s and the prize is being given in, in the year 2009. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular reason why um, in recent years there's been a, a, a compelling case given to, to rewarding these researchers now? Yes, um, according to, to the statutes, uh, um, a prize that is old, it, it should have, there should be some, some reason, that some actuality should, should appear. And I think everyone uh, uh, real, realized, I mean, for every one of us, uh, the impact of, of these, uh, the work that is awarded with these two prizes, the, 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 this prize shared with, with between two, uh, is, is so evident for everyone. I mean, uh, the way we are connected today, the way the communication works, the way we, we uh, uh, can image uh, uh, things that happen and, and we can transmit easily, I mean, it is so evident. And that was not evident 20 years ago. And in terms of, of, of the, the way the prize is shared, was it a straightforward decision to, to award half the, the prize to each of these subjects? Well, you can choose. I mean, the, the, again, the statutes allows you to, to uh, share uh, the prize or, or to, to, to divide it into two, two, two parts. And we thought that uh, it was um, a, a good combination. I mean, they are linked to, they are diff distinctly different, but they are linked to each other. And it was, uh, uh, we're very happy that we could do it in this way. And is it telling a particular story? 
I think it is. I mean, uh, these are so important. Uh, uh, these are cornerstones in, in, in the information communication society we live in today. And have you had a chance to speak to all of the new laureates? Uh, not all, uh, unfortunately. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, we were not able to, to find, and we don't know. Maybe he's out sailing. I don't think so, but he's a keen sailor, and, and he's known to be sailing. But uh, hopefully, hopefully the, uh, we have uh, been able to contact him now. But we couldn't just before the press conference. And, and were, were, were the two laureates you did contact surprised to hear the news? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, um, of course, uh, this is a long time ago, and, and uh, they were... But, uh, uh, they were really very glad, of course, for this. Professor Norgren, thank you very much for discussing this with us. Thank you. For more information about the 2009 prize in physics, please visit nobelprize.org, where you can already see the official background information to the prize, and soon you'll be able to see exclusive interviews with the new laureates. That's about it for this webcast, but join us tomorrow where you can discover who will be receiving the 2009 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, the announcement scheduled for 11.45 Central European time. But until then, it's goodbye from all of us at nobelprize.org.